Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Karen Albright and today I'll be speaking to you about secondary stroke prevention from the bench to the bedside. I'm a vascular neurologist and an epidemiologist by training. And so our objectives today are to describe the role that platelet function phenotype, CYP2C19 genotype, and ABCB1 genotype may play in antiplatelet selection in the future. As you know, in the past, we had some medicines that caused a lot of side effects. Currently, our antiplatelet medications for secondary stroke prevention um, are a little better. We have various medic medications such as aspirin, agronox, and clopidogrel. And as you can see from the chart here, each of these medications has a different class and level of evidence, with aspirin having the highest class and level, followed by agronox and clopidogrel being the third. In secondary stroke prevention, we also have dual antiplatelet therapy, which is aspirin and Plavix. And that usually is in three different protocols, Sampras, Chance, and Point. For the purposes of this talk, we won't get into the details of that, but I just want you to know that those exist. So the future, all joking aside, is really moving from trial and error medicine to genotype based treatment. So historically, providers have given patients drug A, try this drug, let me know how it goes. If the patient gets side effects, they try drug B. If the problem comes out or isn't handled, we consider it ineffective and go to drug C. But in the future, and perhaps currently, we may move to genotype-based treatment, where you know a patient's genotype and you select the drug or dosage based on that. For example, in some electronic medical records, if you were to try to order, in this case, vericonazole, you would learn the metabolizer status and get instructions to use a reduced dose. You could either check below for the age and phenotype adjusted dose, which they've offered here, or if you want to continue with a different dose, you could override it. So I'm gonna tell you a few stories about patients that I've taken care of and um, their experiences and mine with precision medicine. So the first is Mrs. R. Mrs. R is a 76 year old Caucasian woman who came to the hospital complaining that her right foot was dragging. Her history was significant for TIAs and ischemic stroke. And she reported she had had four of these. She also had high blood pressure and high cholesterol. She was on secondary stroke prevention medications. Um, she was taking clopidogrel or Plavix for her antiplatelet agent. She was taking a high dose statin and had been on the appropriate blood pressure medications when she needed them. So looking at provider and patient behavior, the first question we asked is, were secondary stroke prevention medications prescribed for her? And, and yes, they were, as we just covered. The second question is, was she adherent to these medications? And yes, according to her pharmacy records, she was. So how can the correct prescribing of secondary stroke prevention medications and adherence to those medications result in a recurrent stroke? So let's talk a little bit about ischemic stroke. So what is an ischemic stroke? Um, ischemic strokes occur generally when blood clots uh, block an artery and prevent blood flow to an area of the brain. And as you can see here in blue, this is an area of the brain that did not receive proper blood flow, oxygen, et cetera, because of a blood clot. So how do blood clots form? Well, one thing important in blood clots are platelets and, and platelets are cell fragments. They have no nucleus. And as you can see in the lower picture here, they are lens shaped when they are not activated but when they become activated, they get dendritic extensions. And that's what you see here. Um, platelets contain granules that release clotting mediators once activated, and they can clump together to form a platelet plug, which is um, our primary 
um, mechanism of blood clotting or um, hemostasis. So how do these antiplatelet agents that we prescribe to stroke patients work? How do they prevent recurrent stroke? And you can see in the picture here, each of these green lines is one pathway that can uh, lead to platelet aggregation. So our first medicine, and the medicine with the highest level and class of evidence, is aspirin. And what it does is irreversibly inhibits COX-1. And by doing that, it blocks the formation of thromboxane A2. Our second medicine is Agrinox. And Agrinox is a combination of dipyridamol and aspirin. And this works by inhibiting phosphodiesterase type 5 enzyme. And that's through the cyclic AMP pathway. Our third medication and fourth medication are clopidogrel and ticagrelor. And these medications bind to the receptors for ADP on the platelet surface. Uh, these drugs are closely related, but clopidogrel is irreversible, whereas uh, ticagrelor is reversible. So how can we know if Mrs. R's clopidogrel is actually inhibiting her platelet aggregation? One option is something called light transmission agrogometry. This assesses in vitro platelet to platelet clump formation. And we can investigate different pathways by using different agonists, such as collagen, arachidonic acid, and ADP. LTA uh, uses plasma, platelet-rich plasma, as you see in the picture on the left. And you can see the cells there not clumped, whereas on the right, after you've added an aggregating agent, they are clumped. And the difference in the left and the right is the amount of light that passes through, and we can actually quantify that. LTA is very uh, labor and time intensive. Now we have newer tests. One example is Verify Now, which is a point of care test. This comes with two different cartridges, the aspirin cartridge and the P2Y12 cartridges, which works for both plasma and ticagrelor. And this correlates well with the LTA but does not require so much manpower and time. How it works is you have a cartridge containing fibrinogen-coated beads, and then the agonist you want to add, for example, ADP if you're testing Plavix. As you can see there on the left, there's a tube that says verify now that contains whole blood that is literally put into the machine then the platelets clump on the fibrinogen-coated beads. So when they clump, it increases the amount of light that gets transmitted through the sample. So inhibited platelets do not clump on the beads, and this decreases the amount of light. So the one that's circled now is where it's not clumping and you have less light passing through. And the one on the right, they do clump and you can see more light passes through. So the P2Y12 cartridge measures P2Y12 reaction units. And uh, while this bedside test is very useful, it can be confounded by other medications such as Platol and 2B3A inhibitors. Here's an example um, in our plot here, you can see on the x-axis, we have receptor reactivity, which in this case is PRU. And on the y-axis, we have event risk. Our therapeutic window for PRU is between 85 and 208. Anything in red is below 85, which is our bleeding risk. And anything on the right in gray above 208 is our ischemic or clot risk. So our goal is to be somewhere between 85 and 208. Verify Now also has an aspirin cartridge and it measures ARU, aspirin reaction units. And you can see that this can be confounded by also 2B3 inhibitors, but other drugs as well, such as dipyridamol, which is found in Agrinox, clopidogrel, and NSAIDs. Here's a similar graph for ARU, and you can see that the values changed. 
The red portion describes less than 350 and the gray portion greater than 549. So here, the therapeutic window for aspirin is 350 to 549. Before you perform one of these tests, you need to ensure that it, uh, the patient is adherent to the drug, and we need about seven days to know that. This can be accomplished through pill count or pharmacy records where you calculate the proportion of the days covered. Uh, another option is the eight question Morisky questionnaire for medication adherence. So returning to our patient, Mrs. R. When we looked at her platelet function studies, uh, we found this is the report. The aggregation and ATP release to the other agonists, thrombin, collagen, and ADP were within normal limits. Now, this is a woman who was taking clopidogrel. Therefore, Mrs. R was a clopidogrel hypo responder. And sometimes you'll see in the literature, these folks described as non-responders or even as having high on treatment platelet reactivity or overreactive platelets. So what would make someone who was adherent to clopidogrel a non-responder? Well, one thing is that clopidogrel itself is a prodrug. Prodrugs must be activated in order to have the desired pharmacologic effect. So clopidogrel itself will not have the effect you want in your body. It must be converted to its active form. So to convert a prodrug to its active metabolite, it must be absorbed in the intestine and it must undergo bioactivation in the liver. And specifically, we know that clopidogrel undergoes two oxidative steps. You can see here on the left that CYP2C19 does 45% of the first oxidative step and 21% of the second step. So CYP2C19 is very involved in the activation of clopidogrel. So is it possible that Mrs. R was unable to activate clopidogrel? To look into this, we have to think about the CYP2C19 protein. Uh, this is the major enzyme, as we just saw, involved in the generation of the active metabolite of clopidogrel, and it's encoded by a gene of the same name. This gene is located on the long arm of chromosome 10. And what we're talking about here when we talk about a gene that's affecting the way a drug is metabolized or the side effects that it might cause, we're talking about pharmacogenomics. Uh, this is the study of all genes involved in a response to a drug. And pharmacogenomics is often used to refer to the study of the interface of genomics, genetics, and drugs used in clinical therapeutics. So for Mrs. R, could it be that her response to clopidogrel is related to her CYP2C19 genotype? This is a reminder for those of you who do not remember uh, alleles, but alleles are just gene variants. And in, in this picture here, you get a large A and a small A from your father, a large A and a small A from your mother, and the combination of those makes up your genotype. Um, different alleles can lead to different observable characteristics, which we refer to as phenotypes. So here, the CYP2C19 alleles, or genotype, predict a metabolizer phenotype. And we have some common alleles. There are other alleles, um, I believe 35 or more, but we're just going to focus on the most common ones here. Star 1, which is your wild type allele, is normal function and star two through star eight are loss of function alleles. On the other end of the spectrum is star 17, which is a gain of function allele. Now, when you bring those alleles together, you create a diplotype. And from that diplotype, we can predict your phenotype and your enzyme activity. So for example, if you have two wild type alleles, we predict you would be an extensive metabolizer with normal activity. If you have one gain of function allele or two, we predict that you will be an ultra rapid metabolizer with increased or normal enzyme activity. If you have two loss of function alleles, we predict you will be a poor metabolizer and have low or deficient enzyme activity. And if you have 
one wild type and one loss of function or one loss of function and one gain of function, we predict you will be an intermediate metabolizer with intermediate enzyme activity. So how common are these metabolizer phenotypes by ancestry? So the uh, ones we're concerned about are the intermediate metabolizers and the poor metabolizers. So for those who are Asian Americans, it's over 50%. For African Americans, it's over 30%. Ashkenazi Jewish Americans, over 27%. Caucasian Americans, nearly 25%. And Hispanic Americans, over 23%. So these individuals who are clopidogrel hyporesponders require a different antiplatelet agent. The usual dose of Plavix 75 milligrams daily is not gonna have the same effect in intermediate and poor metabolizers as it does in normal metabolizers. So when we checked Mrs. R CYP2C19 genotype, we found that she was a star two, star 17. And you can go to the CPIC page and actually enter that data. So here we've entered star two, star 17, and it tells us the implications are reduced platelet inhibition, increased residual platelet aggregation, and increased risk for adverse cardiovascular events. It also makes recommendations and tells us that an alternate antiplatelet therapy would be recommended if not contraindicated. So are these alleles clinically relevant? I mean, is this simply about pharmacokinetics or does this affect an individual? Um, so I'll provide for you a couple examples from the literature. Uh, one is acute coronary syndrome. Here, CYP2C19 loss of function allele carriers were found to be at increased risk of major cardiovascular events and stent thrombosis. And in addition, a gene dose relationship was observed, meaning that having one of these alleles puts you at increased risk, but having two of these alleles puts you at even higher risk. So what would a cardiologist do for Mrs. R? If she had acute coronary syndrome, um, was about to undergo PCI, and needed a stent placed. They would follow her genotype results, see that she is the third column on the right, intermediate metabolizer, star two, star 17, and they would consider an alternate antiplatelet agent. Well, can we use, as vascular neurologists, can we use these newer agents? So one of the agents they recommend is Prasagril. Um, this is also a prodrug and also requires CYP2C19 to be activated. Um, CYP2C19 does not play such a major role in the metabolism of prasagrel as it does with clopidogrel, but it's important nonetheless. The issue here is that um, the FDA has a warning against using prasagrel in patients with a history of TIA, stroke, or intracranial bleeding. So what about ticagrelor? Ticagrelor, and with this drug, CYP2C19 is not required for drug metabolism. And I'll show you one of our stroke studies. Um, this was called the Socrates trial. Over 13,000 TIA or non-severe ischemic stroke patients were enrolled in this trial and loaded with either ticagrelor or aspirin followed by a daily dose. And what we saw here is ticagrelor provided a relative risk reduction of stroke and the composite outcome of stroke and mind death. However, the confidence intervals included one. Bleeding risks were similar in both groups. So what should a vascular neurologist do? It says we should consider an alternative antiplatelet agent in someone with star two, star 17, but Prasagril has a warning in anyone who's had a history of stroke and ticagrelor did not, through the study I showed you, um, show superiority over aspirin. Well, maybe we should take a step back and just ask, does CYP2C19 genotype really matter in recurrent stroke prevention? And to answer this question, we have a, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Here, they compared intermediate metabolizers or and poor metabolizers as the exposure of in, in, interest 
excuse me, to everyone else. And the outcome was recurrent stroke, whether ischemic or hemorrhagic. 15 studies uh, went into this. Two were post hoc of randomized controlled trials and 13 were cohort studies. Unfortunately, eight of these studies did not collect CYP2C19 star 17. There were over 4,700 patients in the study. Most of these studies were from East Asia. Only three studies included European ancestry, and there were fewer than 100 African Americans. So if we look here, you can see uh, highlighted in red is higher risk of stroke. These are risk ratios. This first one we're looking at individuals who have one loss of functional allele or carriers, and we're comparing them to everyone else. And a risk ratio of one means no difference. So here we see those with one loss of functional allele have 1.79 times the risk as those who don't have a loss of function allele. Well, what if you have two loss of function alleles, or in other words, are a poor metabolizer? So if that is the case, you will see that the risk of recurrent stroke is two and a half times that of those who have no loss of function allele. So I think we can conclude that CYP2C19 loss of function allele is associated with recurrent stroke based on the data we have available and that there's a biologic gradient. So what we know to date, we, we know that these are things associated with thrombosis, whether it's MI or stroke. Uh, CYP2C19 loss of function alleles, as well as hyporesponse to antiplatelet agents also known as high end treatment platelet reactivity. So both genotype and phenotype can be measured in a, in a valid reproducible manner. Does this fit with our clinical observations? Do clinical observations fit with published studies? So I'm gonna show you two patients here. First patient is Mr. W. He is an avid Star Trek fan. This is a 56 year old Asian American man who came to my clinic complaining of recurrent stroke symptoms. He has a history of a right pontine infarct, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and obstructive sleep apnea. He had been placed on dual antiplatelet therapy in the past for severe right vertebral artery stenosis. After 90 days, his aspirin was stopped and he was continued only on clopidogrel and high dose statin. He complained to me that he had been in the emergency room seven times in the last four years. And when we calculated his adherence, it was greater than 80%. So again, we're seeing the correct medications were prescribed to prevent recurrent stroke. The patient is adherent to these medicines and yet he's complaining of recurrent TIAs. So we genotyped Mr. W and he is a star one, star two. So for CYP2C19, this implies reduced platelet inhibition, increased residual platelet aggregation, and of course, increased risk for adverse cardiovascular events. So what did we do? We shared this information with him and replaced his clopidogrel with two baby aspirin. He was quite happy about this because his copay for Plavix was $75 a month and he has had no stroke symptoms since this change was made, which is almost two years. So I put this picture for him. Our second patient is Mrs. R, and she's Mrs. R number two since we opened with the Mrs. R. This is a 66-year-old Caucasian woman who was admitted to the hospital for worsening right leg weakness. Her history is significant for a prior stroke which caused her to have some remaining weakness on the right side, hypertension and coronary artery disease. She had been placed on clopidogrel because of her prior stroke, but was not able to tolerate a statin because of muscle pain. Her MRI showed that she had bilateral ACA infarcts despite being adherent to clopidogrel. In fact, she was 90% adherent. If you're wondering why uh, or how she had bilateral ACA infarcts, 
It turns out that both of her ACAs came from her left internal carotid artery. So she was prescribed the correct medications. She was adherent to those medicines, and yet she had a recurrent stroke. So the first thing we did for Mrs. R number two is looked at her platelet function testing on Clopidogrel, and her PRU came back 238. As I said, we had checked adherence on her. We made sure she had no medications, which would cause drug-drug gene interactions, and yet, she looks like she's at risk for clotting. We replaced her clopidogrel with ticagrelor and then rechecked her PRU. This time it was 42, putting her at potential risk for bleeding. Now, because her stroke came from her carotid, we had to work with our interventionalist because he wanted to place a stent and would not place a stent unless she was in target range. She never perfectly got to target range. She was too high on clopidogrel and perhaps too low on ticagrelor. Nonetheless, she continues on ticagrelor with no stroke symptoms and no bleeding problems since that time. We genotyped her and we were very surprised to find that she was a star one, star 17. And had to ask why was her PRU elevated on clopidogrel when she did not have a CYP2C19 loss of function allele. So we had to return to, to the bench to think again about how clopidogrel gets absorbed. So there's a glycoprotein transporter that actually can limit clopidogrel intestinal absorption. If you don't absorb it, you can't bioactivate it. So we know that certain ABCB1 variants are associated with decreased clopidogrel absorption, lower levels of active metabolite, and increased risk of thrombotic events. How common is that? Well, in one randomized controlled trial, 26, more than 26% of participants had a variant that was associated with decreased clopidogrel absorption. So this taught us the lesson that genotype matters. Right now we're focused on glycoproteins that affect absorption, on enzymes that affect bioactivation, and there are probably many others. So what is the future? Some would argue that the future is now. For example, Many patients come to clinic with a pharmacogenomic report. Here's an example. This is one where it shows you by category. If you were interested in anticoagulants and your patient brought this report, um, it says this patient also has a VCORC1 variant that could further alter do dosing considerations of warfarin. Many of these reports also show you drug by drug. And here on the right, you can see each genotype how this may affect and how you should change dosing. And on the far right, the stars show you the level of evidence. So currently we have the capability of evaluating an individual and see if they are appropriately responding to an antiplatelet agent. Do they have high on treatment platelet reactivity? And we can use genetic information to predict who is likely to not respond appropriately to particular medications. And some of that, I showed you the example of, of the report patients bring to clinic. So putting this all together, if we combine our current testing methods with an evidence-based algorithm, we could select the best medication for each individual patient and possibly reduce recurrent vascular events and even adverse drug events. And we are currently working on a pilot study Passport or the personalized antiplatelet secondary stroke prevention trial. Um, this is an exploratory trial where we're evaluating the safety and feasibility of an early initiated phenotype and genotype driven precision medicine approach to antiplatelet therapy in ischemic stroke survivors. So this is the future, this is the present. I would be happy to take any questions. Um, I provided my email at the beginning of this talk. So if you have a question, just feel, to, feel free to email me and I'd be happy to answer it. Thank you for your attention.